superstitious The devil's on his way So very terrible to see you again. Welcome back for another evening of spooky stories with the Maplewood Strollers. I'm Mrs. Emma Terry, and I'll be your waitress at this feast of fear, your captain on the sea of sorrows, your Elvira with more clothing. Well, it seems we are still in a pandemic. What a relief. For a while there, there was some concern that it might be ending. Well, gather ye nightshade while ye may. I remember my first pandemic as though it were a century ago. The Black Plague, now that was a party. And the fashion, play chic. This year, we've assembled yet another skeleton crew to entertain you with the twisted tales of H.H. H. Monroe, otherwise known as Saki. This sardonic Scottish writer, who lived from 1870 to 1916, liked to pit stuffy Edwardians against forces of both the natural and the supernatural. Rarely did the humans come out on top, my kind of man. For our first tale, we shall hear a story about a story. An aunt who has absolutely no way with children and a lone man who knows exactly what their warped little minds enjoy make for strange traveling companions in The Storyteller. It was a hot afternoon and the railway carriage was correspondingly sultry. And the next stop was at Templecombe, nearly an hour ahead. The occupants of the carriage were a small girl and a smaller girl and a boy. An aunt belonging to the children occupied one corner seat, and the further corner seats on the opposite side was occupied by a bachelor who was a stranger to their party. But the small girls and the boy emphatically occupied the compartment. Both the aunt and the children were conversational in a limited, persistent way. Reminding one of the attentions of a housefly that refuses to be discouraged. Most of the aunt's remarks seem to begin with, don't, and nearly all the children's remarks began with, why? The bachelor said nothing. Out loud. Don't, Cyril, don't, exclaimed the aunt. <coughs> As the small boy began smacking the cushions of the seat, producing a cloud of dust to each blow. Come here and, and, and look out the window. The child moved reluctantly to the window. Why are those sheep being driven out of that field? Oh, well, I expect there are, they are being driven to another field where there is more grass, said the but aunt weakly. there's lots of grass in that, that field. There's nothing else but grass there. Well, perhaps the, the grass in the other field is better. Why is it better? Came the swift, inevitable question. Oh, look at those cows! Nearly every field along the line had contained cows or bullocks, but she spoke as though she were drawing attention to a rarity. Why is the grass in the other field better? Persisted the children. The frown on the bachelor's face was deepening to a scowl. He was a hard, unsympathetic man, the, the aunt decided in her mind. She was utterly unable to come to any satisfactory decision about the grass in the other field. The smaller girl created a diversion by beginning to recite On the Road to Mandalay. She only knew the first line, but she put her limited knowledge to the fullest possible use. She repeated the line over and over again in a dreamy but resolute and very audible voice. It seemed to the bachelor as though someone had had a bet with her that she could not repeat the line aloud 2,000 times without stopping. Whoever it was who had made that wager was likely to lose his bet. Come 
over here and uh, and listen to a story, said the aunt, when the bachelor had looked twice at her and once at the communication cord. The children moved listlessly towards the aunt's end of the carriage. Evidently, her reputation as a storyteller did not rank high in their estimation. In a low, confidential voice, interrupted at frequent intervals by loud, petulant questionings from her listeners. She began an unenterprising and deplorably uninteresting story about a little girl who was good and made friends with everyone on account of her goodness and was finally saved from a mad bull by a number of rescuers who admired her moral character. Wouldn't they have saved her if she hadn't been good? It was exactly the question that the bachelor had wanted to ask. Well, yes, admitted the aunt lamely. But I don't think they would have run quite so fast to help her if they had not liked her so much. It's the stupidest story I've ever heard. I didn't listen after the first bit. It was so stupid. You don't seem to be a success as a storyteller, said the bachelor suddenly from his corner. The aunt bristled in instant defense at this unexpected attack. It's a very difficult thing to tell stories that children can both understand and appreciate. I don't agree with you. Oh. <laughs> well, perhaps you would like to tell them a story. Tell us a story. Once upon a time, there was a little girl called Bertha, who was extraordinarily good. The children's momentarily aroused interest began at once to flicker. All stories seemed dreadfully alike, no matter who told them. She did all that she was told. She was always truthful. She kept her clothes clean, ate milk puddings as though they were jam tarts, learned her lessons perfectly, and was polite in her manners. Was she pretty? Not as pretty as any of you, but she was horribly good. There was a wave of reaction in favor of the story. The word horrible in connection with goodness was a novelty that commended itself. She was so good that she won several medals for goodness, which she always wore pinned to her dress. There was a medal for obedience, another medal for punctuality, and a third for good behavior. They were large metal medals, and they clinked against one another as she walked. No other child in the town where she lived had as many as three medals. So everybody knew that she must be an extra good child. Horribly good. Everybody talked about her goodness. And the prince of the country got to hear about it. And he said that as she was so very good, she might be allowed once a week to walk in his park, which was just outside of town. It was a beautiful park. And no children were ever allowed in it. So it was a great honor for Bertha to be allowed to go there. Were there any sheep in the park? No, there were no sheep in the park, but there were lots of little pigs running all over the place. What color were they? Um, black with white faces, white with black spots, black all over, gray with white patches, and some were white all over. Bertha was rather sorry to find that there were no flowers in the park. She had promised her aunts that she would not pick any of the kind princess flowers. And she had meant to keep her promise. So, of course, it made her feel silly to find that there were no flowers to pick. Why weren't there any flowers? Because the pigs had eaten them all. The gardeners had told the prince that you couldn't have pigs and flowers. So he decided to have pigs and no flowers. There were lots of other delightful things in the park. There were ponds with gold and blue and green fish in them, and trees with beautiful parrots that said clever things at a moment's notice, and hummingbirds that hummed all of the popular tunes of the day. Bertha walked up and, up and down and enjoyed herself immensely and thought to herself, if I were not so extraordinarily good, I should not have been allowed to come to this beautiful park and enjoy all that there is to be seen in it. And her three medals clinked against one another as she walked and helped to remind her how very good she really was. 
And then an enormous wolf came prowling into the park to see if he could catch a fat little pig for his supper. What color was it? Mud color, all over, with a black tongue and pale gray eyes that gleamed with unspeakable ferocity. The first thing that it saw in the park was Bertha. Her pinafore was so spotlessly white and clean that it could be seen from a great distance. Bertha saw the wolf and saw that it was stealing towards her. And she began to wish that she had never been allowed to come into the park. She ran as hard as she could, and the wolf came after her with huge leaps and bounds. She managed to reach the shrubbery of myrtle bushes, and she hid herself in one of the thickest of the bushes. The wolf came sniffing among the bushes, its black tongue lolling out of its mouth, and its pale gray eyes glaring with rage. Bertha was terribly frightened and thought to herself, if I had not been so extraordinarily good, I should have been safe in the town at this moment. However, the scent of myrtle was so strong that the wolf could not sniff out where Bertha was hiding. And the bushes were so thick that he might have hunted about in them for a long time without catching sight of her. So he thought he might as well go off and catch a little pig instead. Bertha was trembling very much at having the wolf prowling and sniffing so near her. And as she trembled, the medal for obedience clinked against the medals for good conduct and punctuality. The wolf was just moving away when he heard the sound of the medals clinking and stopped to listen. They clinked again in a bush quite near him. He dashed into the bush, his pale gray eyes gleaming with ferocity and triumph. He dragged Bertha out and devoured her to the last morsel. All that was left of her were shoes, bits of clothing, and the three medals for goodness. Were any of the little pigs killed? No, they all escaped. The story began badly, but it had a beautiful ending. It is the most beautiful story that I ever heard. It is the only beautiful story I have ever heard. A most improper story to tell young children. You have undermined the effect of years of careful teaching. At any rate, said the bachelor, collecting his belongings preparatory to leaving the carriage, I kept them quiet for ten minutes, which was more than you were able to do. unhappy woman. He observed himself as he walked down the platform of Templecombe Station. For the next six months or so, those children will assail her in public with demands for an improper story. <laughs> oh, you. I bet you say that to all the undead virtual Halloween hostesses. <laughs> Oh, hello again. Wasn't that a wicked gentleman? Most agreeable, wouldn't you say? I am curious as to why the aunt didn't simply ride her broomstick to wherever it was they were going. You just know a harpy like that has one. I hope to be just like her one day. Also, I thought those rotten children looked awfully familiar. Must have seen them on a milk carton somewhere. Anyway, for our next tale of tumult, we will meet a truly wild boy who might just be more than he seems. How do I put this delicately? Well, let's just say his likes and dislikes include full moons, flea powder, and a nice juicy bone every now and again. Let's all howl for the tale of Gabriel Ernest. <laughs> There is a wild beast in your woods, said the artist Cunningham as he was being driven to the station. It was the only remark he had made during the drive. But as Van Cheel had talked incessantly, his companion's silence had not been noticeable. A stray fox or two and some resident weasels, nothing more formidable, said Van Cheel. The artist 
said nothing. Uh, what do you mean about a wild beast? Nothing. My imagination. Here is the train. Goodbye. That afternoon, Van Cheel went for one of his frequent rambles through his woodland property. He had a stuffed heron in his study and knew the names of quite a number of wildflowers. So his aunt had possibly some justification in describing him as a great naturalist. At any rate, he was a great walker. It was his custom to take mental notes of everything he saw during his walks to provide topics for conversation afterwards. When the bluebells began to show themselves in flower, he made a point of informing everyone of the fact. What Van Cheel saw on this particular afternoon was, however, something far removed from his ordinary range of experience. On a shelf of smooth stone overhanging a deep pool was a boy drying himself luxuriously in the sun. His wet hair lay close to his head and his eyes with an almost tigerish gleam in them were turned towards Van Cheel with a certain lazy watchfulness. It was an unexpected apparition and Van Cheel found himself engaged in the novel process of thinking before he spoke. Where on earth could this wild looking boy hail from? The miller's wife had lost a child some two months ago, supposed to have been swept away by the mill stream. But that had been a mere baby, not a half-grown lad. What are you doing there? Obviously, sunning myself. Where do you live? Here, in these woods. You can't live in the woods. They are very nice woods. But where do you sleep at night? I don't sleep at night. That's my busiest time. The Van Cheel began to have an irritated feeling that he was grappling with a problem that was eluding him. What do you feed on? Flesh, said the boy. And he pronounced the word with slow relish, as though he were tasting it. Flesh? What flesh? Since it interests you, rabbits, wildfowl, hares, poultry, lambs in their season, and children when I can get any. They're usually too well locked in at night, though, when I do most of my hunting. It's been quite two months since I've tasted child flesh. Uh, yeah, yeah, you're talking rather through your hat when you speak of feeding on hares. Our hillside hares aren't easily caught. At night, I hunt on four feet. I suppose you mean that you hunt with a dog? The boy rolled slowly over onto his back and laughed a weird <laughs> low laugh. <laughs> That was pleasantly like a chuckle and disagreeably like a snarl. I don't fancy any dogs would be very anxious for my company, especially at night. Van Cheel began to feel that there was something positively uncanny about the strange-eyed, strange-tongued youngster. I can't have you staying in these woods, he declared authoritatively. I fancy you rather me here than in your house. The prospect of this wild animal in Van Cheel's primly ordered house was certainly an alarming one. If you don't go, I shall have to make you. The boy turned like a flash plunged into the pool, and in a moment had flung himself halfway up the bank where Van Cheel was standing. In an otter, the movement would not have been remarkable. In a boy, Van Cheel found it sufficiently startling. His foot slipped as he made an involuntarily backward movement, and he found himself almost prostrate on the slippery weed-grown bank, with those tigerish eyes not very far from his own. 
almost instinctively, he half raised his hand to his throat. The boy laughed again, a laugh in which the snarl had nearly driven out the chuckle. And then, with another of his astonishing lightning movements, plunged out of view into a yielding tangle of weed and fern. What an extraordinary wild animal, said Van Cheel as he picked himself up. And then he recalled Cunningham's remark. There is a wild beast in your woods. Walking slowly homeward, Van Cheel began to turn over in his mind various local occurrences which might be traceable to the existence of this astonishing young savage. Something had been thinning the game in the woods lately. Poultry had been missing from the farms. Hares were growing unaccountably scarcer. And complaints had reached him of lambs being carried off bodily from the hills. Uh, was it possible that this wild boy was really hunting the countryside in company with some clever poacher dogs? He had spoken of hunting four-footed by night. But then again, he had hinted strangely at no dog caring to come near him, especially at night. It was certainly puzzling. And then Van Chiel came suddenly to a dead stop, alike in his walk and his speculations. The child missing from the mill two months ago, the accepted theory was that it had tumbled into the stream and been swept away. But the mother had always declared she had heard a shriek on the hill side of the house, in the opposite direction from the water. It was unthinkable, of course, but he wished that the boy had not made that uncanny remark about child flesh eaten two months ago. Such dreadful things should not be said even in fun. Van Chiel contrary to his usual want, did not feel disposed to be communicative about his discovery in the wood. His position as a parish counselor and justice of the peace seemed somehow compromised by the fact that he was harboring a personality of such doubtful repute on his property. There was even a possibility that a heavy bill of damages for raided lambs and poultry might be laid at his door. At dinner that night, he was unusually silent. Where's your voice gone to? One would think you had seen a wolf. Van Cheel, who was not familiar with the old saying, thought the remark rather foolish. If he had seen a wolf on his property, his tongue would have been extraordinarily busy with the subject. At breakfast next morning, Van Chiel was conscious that his feeling of uneasiness regarding yesterday's episode had not wholly disappeared. And he resolved to go by train to the neighboring town, hunt up Cunningham, and learn from him what he had really seen that had prompted rem the remark about a wild beast in the woods. With this resolution taken, his usual cheerfulness partially returned and he hummed a bright little melody as he sauntered to the morning room for his customary cigarette. As he entered the room, the melody made way abruptly for a pious invocation, gracefully a sprawl on the ottoman in an attitude of almost exaggerated repose was the boy of the woods. How dare you come here? You told me I was not to stay in the woods. But, 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 but not to come here. <laughs> Supposing my aunt should see you. That moment, his aunt entered the room. Uh, <laughs> uh, this is a poor boy who's lost his way. And lost his memory. He, he, he doesn't know who he is. Or where he comes from, explained Van Chiel desperately, glancing apprehensively at the waif's face to see whether he was going to add inconvenient candor to his other savage propensities. Miss Van Chiel was enormously interested. Perhaps what le what's left of his clothing is marked. 
A poor homeless child appealed to Miss Van Cheel as warmly as a stray kitten or a derelict puppy would have done. Mm -hmm. We must do all we can for him, she decided. And in a very short time, a messenger dispatched to the rectory where a page boy was kept had returned with a suit of pantry clothes and the necessary accessories of shirt, shoes, collar, etc. Clothed, clean, and groomed, the boy lost none of his uncanniness in Van Cheel's eyes. But his aunt found him sweet. We must call him something till we know who he really is. Gabriel Ernest, I think. Those are nice, suitable names. Van Cheel uh, agreed but he privately doubted whether they were being grafted onto a nice, suitable child. <laughs> his misgivings were not diminished by the fact that his staid and elderly spaniel had bolted out of the house at the first incoming of the boy, and now obstinately remained shivering and yapping at the farther end of the orchard, while the canary, usually as vocally industrious as Van Cheel himself, had put itself on an allowance of frightened cheeps. More than ever, he was resolved to consult Cunningham without loss of time. As he drove off to the station, his aunt was arranging that Gabriel Ernest should help her to entertain the infant members of her Sunday school class at tea that afternoon. Come along. Cunningham was not at first disposed to be communicative. My mother died of some brain trouble, so you will understand why I am averse to dwelling on anything of an impossibly fantastic nature that I may see or think that I have seen. But uh, what did you see? What I thought I saw was something so extraordinary that no really sane man could dignify it with the credit of that having actually happened. I was standing, the last evening I was with you, half hidden in the hedge growth by the orchard gate, watching the dying glow of the sunset. Suddenly, I became aware of a boy who was standing out on the open hillside, also watching the sunset. His pose was so suggestive of some wild fawn of pagan myth that I instantly wanted to engage him as a model. And in another moment, I think I should have hailed him. But just then, the sun dipped out of view and all the orange and pink slid out of the landscape, leaving it cold and gray. And at the same moment, an astounding thing happened. The boy vanished too. What? Vanished away into, into, the, into nothing? No, that is the dreadful part of it. On the open hillside where the boy had been standing a second ago stood a large wolf, blackish in color with, with gleaming fangs and, and cruel eyes. You may think that- But I'm... Van Cheel did not stop for anything as futile as thought. Already, he was tearing at top speed towards the station. He dismissed the idea of a telegram. Gabriel Ernest as a werewolf was a hopelessly inadequate effort at conveying the situation. And his aunt would think it was a code message to which he had omitted to give her the key. His one hope was that he might reach home before sundown. The cab which he chartered at the other end of the railway journey bore him with what seemed exasperating slowness along the country roads. Which were pink and mauve with the flush of the sinking sun. His aunt was putting away some unfinished jams and cakes when he arrived. Uh, where is Gabriel Ernest? Oh, he is taking the little tooth child home. It was getting so late. I thought it wasn't safe to let it go back alone. What a lovely sunset, isn't it? But Van Chill, although not oblivious of the glow in the western sky, did not stay to discuss its beauties. At a speed for which he was scarcely geared, he raced along the narrow lane that led to the home of the Toops. On one side ran the swift current of the mill stream, 
On the other rose the stretch of bare hillside. A dwindling rim of red sun showed still on the skyline, and the next turning must bring him in view of the ill-assorted couple he was pursuing. Then the color went suddenly out of things, and a gray light settled itself with a quick shiver over the landscape. Van Cheel heard a shrill wail of fear and stopped running. Nothing was ever seen again of the Toop child or Gabriel Ernest. But the latter's discarded garments were found lying in the road. So it was assumed that the child had fallen into the water and that the boy had stripped and jumped in in a vain endeavor to save it. Van Chiel and some workmen who were nearby at the time testified to having heard a child scream loudly just near the spot where the clothes were found. Mrs. Toop, who had 11 other children, was decently resigned to her bereavement. But Miss Van Cheel sincerely mourned her lost foundling. It was on her initiative that a memorial brass was put up in the parish church to Gabriel Ernest, an unknown boy who bravely sacrificed his life for another. Van Cheel gave way to his aunt in most things, but he flatly re refused to subscribe to the Gabriel Ernest Memorial. Welcome back. Wow, that got a bit hairy, didn't it? The fur was really flying and the claws came out and too much? Right. My ghost writer's jokes have all been very transparent lately. We'll simply have to do better. Speaking of fur, our next story ponders the potentially painful predicament one might find themselves in if their pets specifically their cat, could talk. I myself have two cats. This is Midnight. And this is 4.30. I simply can't imagine what would happen if my cats could talk. If my special recipe for goulash ever got out. The secret is real goulash. That's enough, kitty. Yeah. And now we present to you the tale of Tobermory. It was a chill, rain washed afternoon of a late August day. Lady Brimley's house party was a full gathering of her guests around the tea table on this particular afternoon. The undisguised of the entire party was fixed on the homely, negative personality of Mr. Cornelius Arpin. Of all her guests, he was the one who had come to Lady Blemley with the vaguest reputation. Someone had said he was clever and he got his invitation in the moderate expectation that some portion of his cleverness would be contributed to the general amusement and entertainment. Until tea time that day, she had been unable to discover in what direction, if any, his cleverness lay. He was neither a wit nor a croquet champion, neither a hypnotic force or a begetter of amateur theatricals. Neither did his exterior suggest the sort of man in whom women are willing to pardon a generous measure of mental deficiency. He has subsided into mere Mr. Appen, but now he was claiming to have launched on the world a discovery besides which the invention of gunpowder, of the printing press and of steam locomotion were inconsiderable trifles. Science had made bewildering strides in many directions during recent decades, but this thing seemed to belong to the domain of miracle rather than to scientific achievement. 
And do you really ask us to believe that you have discovered a means for instructing animals in the art of human speech? And that dear Tobermory has proved to be your first successful pupil? It is a problem at which I have worked for the last 17 years, but only during the last eight or nine months have I been rewarded with glimmerings of success. Of course, I've experimented with thousands of animals, but latterly only with cats those wonderful creatures which have assimilated themselves so marvelously with our civilization while retaining all their highly developed feral instincts. Here and there among cats, one comes across an outstanding superior intellect, just as one does among the ruck of human beings. And when I made the acquaintance of Tobermory, your, your Ukrainian wildcat, a week ago, I saw at once that I was in contact with a beyond cat of extraordinary intelligence. I had gone far along the road to success in recent experiments, with Tobermory, as you call her, I have reached the goal. Mr. Appen concluded his remarkable statement in a voice which he strove to divest of a triumphant inflection. No one said rats, though Mavis's lips moved in a monosyllabic contortion, which probably invoked those rodents of disbelief. And do you mean to say that you have taught Tobermory to say and understand easy sentences of one syllable? My dear Miss Resker, one teaches little children and backward adults in that piecemeal fashion. When one has once solved the problem of making a beginning with an animal of highly developed intelligence, one has no need for those halting methods. Tobermory can speak our language with perfect correctness. This time Mavis very distinctly said, beyond rats. Lady Wilford was more polite, but equally skeptical. Well, well, hadn't we better have the cat in and judge for ourselves? Lady Wilford went in search of the animal, and the company settled themselves down to the languid expectation of witnessing some more or less adroit drawing room ventriloquism. In a minute, Lady Wilfred was back in the room. By God, it's true. I, I found her dozing in the smoking room and called for her to come for her tea. She, she blinked at me in her usual way and I said, come on, Toby, don't keep us waiting. And by God, she drawled out in the most horribly natural voice that she'd come when she dashed well pleased. <gasps> I, I nearly jumped out of my skin. Oh my goodness. Oh, oh, a battle-like chorus of startled exclamation arose, amid which the scientist mutely enjoying the first fruit of his stupendous discovery. In the midst of the clamor, Tobermory entered the room and made her way with velvet tread and studied on concern across to the group seated around the tea table. A sudden hush of awkwardness and constraint fell on the company. Somehow there seemed an element of embarrassment in addressing on equal terms a domestic cat of acknowledged mental ability. Will you have some milk, Tobermory? asked Lady Blenley in a rather strained voice. I don't mind if I do was the response, couched in a tone of even indifference. A shiver of suppressed excitement went through the listeners, and Lady Blemley might be excused for pouring out the saucer full of milk rather unsteadily. I'm afraid I've spilt a good deal of it. After all, it is not my oriental carpet. Another silence fell on the group. And then Miss Reska, in her best district visitor manner, asked if the human language had been difficult to learn. Tobermory looked squarely at her for a moment and then fixed her gaze serenely on the middle distance. It was obvious that boring questions lay outside her scheme of life. What, what do you think of human intelligence? 
of whose intelligence in particular? Oh, well, uh, mine, for instance. <laughs> uh -huh. You put me in an embarrassing position. When your inclusion in this house party was suggested, Lady Wilfrid protested that you were the most brainless woman of her acquaintance. And then there was a wide distinction between hospitality and the care of the feeble-minded. Lady Blamely replied that your lack of brain power was the precise quality which had earned you your invitation. As you were the only person she could think of who might be idiotic enough, to buy their old car. You know, the one they call the envy of Sisyphus, because it goes quite nicely up the hill if you push it. Lady Blemley's protestations would have had greater effect. She had not casually suggested to Mavis only that morning that the car in question would be just the thing for her down in her Devonshire home. Lady Wilford plunged in heavily to affect a diversion. How about your carryings on with the, the red tom up at the stables, hmm? Hmm? <laughs> One does not usually discuss these matters in public. From the slight observation of your ways since you've been in this house, I should imagine you'd find it inconvenient if I were to shift the conversation onto your own little affairs. Oh, the panic which ensued was not confined to Lady W. Would you like to go and see if Cook has got your dinner ready? Suggested Lady Blemley hurriedly, ignoring the fact that it was two hours to Tobomori's dinner time. Thanks, but not so quite soon after my tea. I don't want your diet of indigestion. Well, cats have nine lives, you know. Possibly, but only one liver. Lady Blemley, do you mean to encourage this cat to go, to that cat to go out and gossip about us in the servants' hall? The panic had indeed become general. A narrow ornamental balustrade ran in front of most of the bedroom windows at the house. And it was recalled with dismay that this had formed a favorite promenade for Tobermory at all hours, when she could watch the pigeons. And heaven knew what else besides. <sighs> Mavis had the presence of mind to maintain a composed exterior. Privately, she was calculating how much it would take to procure a box of fancy mice as a species of hush money. Oh, why did I ever come down here? Dover and Murray immediately accepted the opening. Judging by what you said to Mrs. Cornet on the croquet lawn yesterday, you were out for food. You described the blameless as the dullest people to stay with that you knew, but said they were clever enough to employ a first-rate cook. Otherwise, they'd find it difficult to get anyone come down a second time. There's not a word of truth in it. Mrs. Cornette repeated your remark afterwards to Bertie Van Pan and said, that woman is a regular hunger marcher. She go anywhere to four square meals a day. And Bertie Van Tan said, this point, the chronicle mercifully ceased. Tobermory had caught a glimpse of a large interloping calico cat at the rectory, working her way through the shrubbery towards the stable wing. In a flash, Toby had vanished through the open French window. <laughs> With the disappearance of his two brilliant pupil, Cornelius Appen found him beset by a hurricane of bitter upbraiding, anxious inquiry, and frightened entreaty. The responsibility for the situation lay with him, and he must prevent matters from becoming worse. 
Could, could Toberbori impart her dangerous gifts to other cats? Was the first question he had to answer. It was possible, he replied, that she might have initiated her intimate friend, the stable puss, into her new accomplishment, but it was unlikely that her teaching could have taken a wider range as yet. Then Tobamori may be a valuable cat and a great pet, but I'm sure you'll agree, Lady Blemley, that both she and the stable cat must be done away with without delay. Don't suppose I've enjoyed the last quarter of an hour, do you? My husband and I are very fond of Tobermory. At least we were before this. Oh, we can put some strychnine in the scraps. She always gets at dinner time. But my great discovery, after all my years of research and experimentation. You gotta go and experiment on the shorthorns at the farm who are under proper control or, or the elephants at the zoo. They're said to be highly intelligent and they don't come creeping around our bedrooms and under our chairs and so forth and so yeah. forth. No one could have felt more crestfallen than Cornelius Appen at the reception of his wonderful achievement. Public opinion, however, was against him. In fact, had the general voice been consulted on the subject, it is probable that a strong minority vote would have been in favor of including him in the strychnine diet. Dinner that evening was not a social success. A plate full of carefully dosed fish scrap was in readiness on the sideboard, but no Tobermory appeared either in the dining room or kitchen. At 11, the servants went to bed announcing that the small window in the pantry had been left open as usual for Toby Maury's private use. Lady Blemley made periodic visits to the pantry, returning each time with an expression of listless depression, which forestalled questioning. At two o'clock, Mavis broke the dominating silence. She won't turn up tonight. She's probably at the local newspaper office at the present moment, dictating the first installment of her reminiscences. It will be the event of the day. Breakfast was, if anything, a more unpleasant function than dinner had been. But before its conclusion, the situation was relieved. Hobo Maury's corpse was brought in from the shrubbery where a gardener had just discovered it. <laughs> from the bites on her throat and the calico fur which coated her claws, it was evident that she had fallen in unequal combat with the big feline from the rectory. By midday, most of the guests had left. Tober Maury had been Athens' one successful pupil, and she was destined to have no successor. A few weeks later, an elephant at the Dresden Zoo in Germany, which had shown no previous signs of irritability, broke loose and killed an Englishman who had apparently been teasing it. The victim's name was variously reported in the papers as Open and Epelin, but his front name was faithfully rendered Cornelius. If he was trying to teach German irregular verbs to the poor beast, he deserved what he got. What an awful tale. The secondhand embarrassment was to die for. That cat would rattle the devil himself. And depending on how many of his nine lives he has left, he just might get that chance. Our next vignette deals with death and reincarnation, but in typical Saki fashion, is told with a mischievous and humorous bent. In other words, it's good fun indeed. I've often wondered what I might come back as in my next life. At the rate my husbands have disappeared, I suppose it would have to be a black widow or maybe a praying mantis. We all know what happens to their husbands. And now it's time for the tale of 
Laura. You are not really dying, are you? asked Amanda. <laughs> I have the doctor's permission to live till Tuesday, said Laura. Oh, but today is Saturday. This is serious. I don't know about it being serious. It is certainly Saturday. Death is always serious. Well, I never said I was going to die. I am presumably going to leave off being Laura. But I shall go on being something. An animal of some kind, I suppose. You see, when one hasn't been very good in the life one has just lived, one reincarnates in some lower organism. And I haven't been very good when one comes to think of it. I've been petty and mean and vindictive and all that sort of thing, when circumstances have seemed to warrant it. Circumstances never warrant that sort of thing. <laughs> Well, if you don't mind my saying so, Egbert is a circumstance that would warrant any amount of that sort of thing. Oh, you're married to him. That's different. You've sworn to love, honor, and endure him. I haven't. I don't see what's wrong with Egbert. Oh, I dare say the wrongness has been on my part. He has merely been the extenuating circumstance. He made a thin, peevish kind of fuss, for instance, when I took the collie puppies from the farm out for a run the other day. They chased his young broods of speckled Sussex hens and drove two sitting hens off their nests. Besides running all over the flower beds, you know how devoted he is to his poultry and garden. Well, anyhow, he needn't have gone on about it the entire evening and then have said, let's say no more about it, just when I was beginning to enjoy the discussion. That's where one of my petty vindictive revenges came in. I turned the entire family of speckled Sussex into his seedling shed the day after the puppy episode. Uh, you. Well, it came quite easy. Two of the hens pretended to be laying at the time, but I was firm. Uh, and we thought it was an accident. <laughs> you see, I really have some grounds for supposing that my next incarnation will be in a lower organism. I shall be an animal of some kind. On the other hand, I, I haven't been a bad sort in my way, so I think I may count on being a nice animal, something elegant and, and lively, with a love of fun. An otter, perhaps. I can't imagine you as an otter. Well, I don't suppose you can imagine me as an angel if it comes to that. Amanda was silent. She couldn't. Personally, I think an otter life would be rather enjoyable. Salmon to eat all year round. And the satisfaction of being able to fetch the trout from their own homes without having to wait for hours till they condescend to rise to the fly you've been dangling before them. And an elegant, felt figure. Think of the otter hounds. How dreadful to be hunted and harried and finally worried to death. Hmm. Rather fun with the half the neighborhood looking on. <laughs> and anyhow, not worse than this Saturday to Tuesday business of dying by inches. And then I should go into something else. If I had been a moderately good otter, I suppose I should get back into human form of some sort. Maybe, maybe as a little brown, unclothed Nubian boy. <laughs> You would be serious. You really ought to be if you're only going to live till Tuesday. As a matter of fact, Laura died on Monday. <laughs> oh, it was so, so awful. Amanda complained to her uncle-in-law, Sir Lulworth Quain. I've, I've asked a lot of, quite a lot of people down for golf and fishing. And the rhododendrons are just looking their best. Laura always was inconsiderate. She was born during Good Wid Week with an ambassador staying in the house who hated babies. Oh, she had the maddest kind of ideas. Do you know if there was any insanity in her family? Mm, insanity. No, I never heard of any. Her father lives in West Kensington, but I believe he's sane in all other subjects. 
he had an idea that she was going to be reincarnated as an otter. One meets with those ideas of reincarnation so frequently, even in the West, that one can hardly set them down as being mad. And Laura was such an unaccountable person in this life that I should not like to lay down definite rules as to what she might be doing in the after state. Oh, you really think she might have passed into some animal form? She was one of those who shaped their opinions rather readily from the standpoint of those around them. Just then, Egbert entered the breakfast room. Where in an air of bereavement that Laura's demise would have been insufficient in itself to account for. Four of my speckled Sussex have been killed! The very four that were to go to the show on Friday. One of them was dragged away and eaten right in the middle of that new carnation bed that I've been to such trouble and expense over. My best flower bed and my best fowls singled out for destruction. It almost seems as if the brute that did the deed had special knowledge how to be as devastating as possible in a short space of time. Was it a fox, do you think? Sounds more like a polecat. No, uh, there were marks of webbed feet all over the place, and we followed the tracks down to the stream at the bottom of the garden. Evidently, an otter. Amanda looked quickly and furtively across at Sir Walworth. Lawworth. Egbert was too agitated to eat any breakfast and went out to superintend the strengthening of the poultry yard defenses. I think she might at least have waited till the funeral was over. It's her own funeral, you know. It's a nice point in etiquette how far one ought to show respect for one's own mortal remains. Disregard for mortuary convention was carried further lengths the next day. During the absence of the family at the funeral ceremony, the remaining survivors of the speckled Sussex were massacred. The marauders' line of retreat seemed to have embraced most of the flower beds on the lawn, and the strawberry beds in the lower garden had also suffered. I shall get the otter hounds to come here at the earliest possible moment. Oh, on no account. You can't dream of such a thing. I mean, it wouldn't do so soon in, in, in the house after a funeral. It is a case of necessity. Once an otter takes to that sort of thing, it won't stop. Uh, uh, perhaps it will go elsewhere now that the others, there's no more fowls left. One would think you wanted to shield the beast. Oh, no, no. There's so little water in the stream lately. It seems hardly sporting to hunt an animal when it has so little chance of taking refuge anywhere. Good gracious. I'm not thinking about sport. I want to have the animal killed as soon as possible. Even Amanda's opposition weakened when, during church time on the following Sunday, the otter made its way into the house, raided half a salmon from the larder, and worried it into scaly fragments on the Persian rug in Edward's studio. We shall have it hiding under our beds and biting pieces out of our feet before long. <laughs> and from what Amanda knew of this particular otter, so she felt that the possibility was not a remote one. On the evening preceding the day fixed for the hunt, Amanda spent a solitary hour walking by the banks of the stream, making what she imagined to be hound noises. Oh, oh, oh! It was charitably supposed by those who overheard her performance that she was practicing for barnyard imitations at the forthcoming village entertainment. <laughs> it was her friend and neighbor, Aurora Barrett, who brought her news of the day's sport. Pity you weren't out. We had quite a good day. We found one in the, just at once in the pool just below your garden. Uh, did you kill? Oh, rather, a fine she-otter. Your husband got rather badly bitten in trying to tail it. 
poor beast. I felt quite sorry for it. It had such a human look in its eyes when it was killed. You'll call me silly, but do you know who the look reminded me of? Oh, my dear woman, what is the matter? When Amanda had recovered to a certain extent from her attack of nervous prostration, Egbert took her to the Nile Valley to recuperate. Ah, change of scene speedily brought about a destined recovery of health and mental balance. The escapades of an adventurous otter in search of a variation of diet were viewed in their proper light. Amanda's normally placid temperament reasserted itself. Uh, hey, get, 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 get. Oh, even in a hurricane of shouted curses coming from her husband's dressing room, and her husband's voice went hardly in his usual vocabulary, failed to disturb the serenity as she made a leisurely toilette one evening in a Cairo hotel. What is the matter? What has happened? <laughs> the little beast has thrown all my clean shirts into the bath. Wait till I kick you, you little... <laughs> oh, what little beast, asked Amanda, suppressing a desire to laugh. Edward's language was so hopelessly inadequate to express his outraged feelings. <laughs> a little beast of a naked brown Nubian boy. Uh, and now Amanda is seriously ill. Ah, you've returned. You're obviously a glutton for punishment. Join the club. No, really, we have donuts. <laughs> we meet every Tuesday at the library. Anyway, our final selection in our annual Fright Fest is about a nervous man seeking respite and ghostly visitors from beyond the grave. What? No, not Elvis, silly. He's still alive. It's true. He works the graveyard shift out at the Wendy's on Route 22. He knows I like my burgers, extra rare. Please enjoy our final offering from that master of the short, sharp, and scary. We present to you one last sake tale entitled the open window. My aunt will be down presently, Mr. Nuttall, said a very self-possessed young lady. In the meantime, you must try and put up with me. Frampton Nuttall, endeavor to say the correct something which should duly flatter the niece of the moment. Without unduly discounting the aunt that was to come. Privately, he doubted more than ever whether these formal visits on a succession of total strangers would do much towards helping the nerve cure which he was supposed to be undergoing. I know how it will be, his sister had said when he was preparing to migrate his rural retreat. You will bury yourself down there and not speak to a living soul, and your nerves will be worse than ever from moping. I shall just give you letters of introduction to all the people I know there. Some of them, as far as I can remember, were quite nice. Frampton wondered whether Mrs. Sappleton, the lady to whom he was presenting one of the letters into introduction, came into the nice division. Do you know many of the people round here? Asked the niece when she judged that they had sufficient silent communion. Hardly a soul. Uh, my sister was staying here at the rectory, you know, some four years ago. And she gave me letters of introduction to some of the people here. He made the last statement in a tone of distinct regret. And you know practically nothing about my aunt? Pursued the self-possessed young lady. Only her name and address, admitted the caller. He was wondering whether Mrs. Sappleton was in the married or widowed state. An undefinable something about the room seemed to suggest masculine habitation. Her great tragedy happened just three years ago. That would be since your sister's time. Her tragedy? Somehow in this restful country spot, tragedies seemed out of place. You may wonder why we keep that window wide open on an October afternoon. 
said the niece, indicating a large French window that opened on to a lawn. It is quite warm for the time of the year, uh, but has that window got anything to do with the tragedy? Out through that window, three years ago to a day, her husband and her two young brothers went off for their day shooting. They never came back. In crossing the moor to their favorite snipe shooting ground, they were all three engulfed in a treacherous piece of bog. It had been that dreadful wet summer, you know, and places that were safe in other years gave way suddenly without warning. Their bodies were never recovered. That was the dreadful part of it. Here the child's voice lost its self-possessed note and became falteringly human. Poor aunt always thinks that they will come back someday. They and the little brown spaniel that was lost with them and walk in at that window just as they used to do. Poor, that is why the window is kept open every evening till it is quite dusk. Poor dear aunt, she has often told me how they went out. Her husband with his white waterproof coat over his arm and Ronnie, her youngest brother, singing, I say, Bertie, why do you bound? As he always did the teaser, because she said it got in her nerves. You know what, on some, sometimes on still quiet evenings like this, I almost get a creepy feeling that they will all walk in through that window. She broke off with a little shudder. It was a relief to Frampton. When the aunt bustled into the room with a whirl of apologies for being late in making her appearance. I hope Vera has been amusing you. She has been very interesting. I hope you don't mind the open window. My husband and brothers will be home directly from shooting and they always come in this way. They've been out for snipe in the marshes today, so they'll make a fine mess over my poor carpets. So like you men folk, isn't it? She rattled on cheerfully about the shooting and the scarcity of birds and the prospects for duck in the winter. To Frampton, it was all purely horrible. He made a desperate, but only partially successful effort. To turn the talk onto a less ghastly topic. He was conscious that his hostess was giving him only a fragment of her attention, and her eyes were constantly straying past him to the open window and the lawn beyond. It was certainly an unfortunate coincidence that he should have paid his visit on this tragic anniversary. The doctors agree in ordering me complete rest, an absence of mental excitement and avoidance of anything in the nature of violent physical exercise, announced Frampton who labored under the tolerably widespread delusion that total strangers and chance acquaintances are hungry for the least detail of one ailments and infirmities, their cause and cure. On the matter of diet, they are not so much in agreement, he continued. No, said Mrs. Sappleton, in a voice which only replaced a yawn at the last moment. Then she suddenly brightened into alert attention. But not to what Frampton was saying. Here they are at last, just in time for tea, and don't they look as if they were muddy up to the eyes. <laughs> Frampton shivered slightly and, and turned towards the niece with a look intended to convey sympathetic comprehension. The child was staring out through the open window with a dazed horror in her eyes. In a chill shock of nameless fear, Frampton swung round in his seat and looked in the same direction. In the deepening twilight, three figures were walking across the lawn towards the window. They all carried guns under their arms and, and one of them was additionally burdened with a white coat hung over his shoulders. A tired brown spaniel kept at their heels. Noiselessly, they neared the house and then a hoarse young voice chanted out of the dusk. I say, Bertie, why do you bound? Frampton grabbed wildly at his stick and hat. The hall door, the gravel drive, and the front gate were dimly noted stages in his headlong retreat. A cyclist coming along the road had to run into the hedge to avoid imminent collision. Here we are, my dear, said the bearer of the white Macintosh coming in through the window. Fairly muddy, but most of it's dry. Who is that who bolted out as we came up? A most extraordinary man, a Mr. Nuttall, 
could only talk about his illnesses and dashed off without a word of goodbye or apology when you arrived. One would think he had seen a ghost. I expect it was a spaniel, said the niece calmly. He told me he had a horror of dogs. He was once hunted into a cemetery somewhere on the banks of the Ganges by a pack of pariah dogs and had to spend the night in a newly dug grave with the creatures snarling and grinning and foaming just above him, enough to make anyone lose their nerve. Bromance at short notice was her specialty. And ladies and skeletons, that concludes our wickedly enchanting evening of Saki stories. We've so enjoyed sharing his tales of wit and woe with you and spreading his gospel of grief is truly a memory we will take to the grave. Well, a tomb for me, please, preferably one with a view. We hope you have had a monstrous time with us here tonight, and we sincerely hope for the very worst for all of you in this, our most glorious season of haunt. Sweet nightmares to you all. Just moved in my new house today. Moving was hard, but I got squared away. Bell started ringing and changed right loud. I knew I'd moved in a haunted house. Still, I made up in my mind to stay. Nothing was gonna drive me away. When I seen something to give me the creep Had one big eye and a two big feet I stood right still and I did the free He did this go right up to me Made a noise with his feet to sound like a drum Say you'll be here when the morning comes I'll be here when the morning comes I'll be right here and I ain't gonna run I bought this house, now you know I'm bald Ain't no Hank gonna run me on In my kitchen my stove was a blazing hot the Coffee was a boiling in the pot had melted in my hand I had a hunk of meat in my hand From out of space that sat a man On a hot stove with a pot and pan Say that's hot, I began to shout He drank a hot coffee right from the spout he ate the raw meat right from my hand Drank a hot grease from the frying pan He said to me, now you better run 